about their neighborhood and, and to make, uh, you know, to help our children learn about Jesus Christ. And so, you know, uh, uh, Joe came to me and said, why don't we have something for our school children? So we approached David and said, David, would you mind if you made some presentations? Well, not only was he willing to make presentations, each classroom came downstairs and we had a room of artifacts, you know, like the, the scourging, the, 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 the scourge, the, the nails, the, 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 the crown of thorns. He had all those things out there for the children. And each group came in, you know, one at a time. And there were, there were uh, almost 16 different presentations. And for 10 minutes, he would explain to them what this is all about. And then he'd allow them to walk through the room and see the things. And he stood around for any questions they had. Now, I can guarantee you, many of these children have seen the crucifix in our classroom. But, you know, I don't think they're ever going to look at a crucifix again in their lives uh, like they used to before they saw that presentation. So I'm so happy for what you did yesterday. Yes. And I'm so happy to have you here this evening. And David, I know you're going to have a wonderful presentation. God bless you. God bless you. David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Father Heron. Thank you, Brother Joe. Uh, really glad to be here. <clears throat> Special evening tonight. The Shroud of Turin. The mystery of the Shroud of Turin. Before I get into the presentation tonight, I just have to say I'm dedicating this presentation to the memory of Mr. Richard Zanath. May God rest his soul. The mystery of the Shroud of Turin, and it is a mystery, it's a murder mystery, but we think, unlike most murder mysteries, we know who the victim is and we know who done it. The question about the Shroud of Turin is, how did the image get on the cloth? And that's what we're hoping to unravel here this evening, how the image got on the cloth. I'm grateful you're here tonight. You could have been a lot of places, but you chose to come here, and I think you'll be glad you did. I have my trusty sidekick, Joe, here helping me. Uh, it's going to be uh, trial and error here, so uh, give us some slack, if you will. Uh, where science meets faith. You know, a lot of people say, <clears throat> when you talk about matters of faith, leave science out. The two are not uh, uh, inclusive. But I would say, I would beg to differ. Uh, the Shroud of Turin uh, is playing, science is playing catch up to the Shroud of Turin. The image on the Shroud of Turin, many scientists are starting to talk about quantum mechanics, quantum physics, uh, which I don't know a whole lot about. Maybe some of you do, but it's a branch of science that we haven't really figured out yet. We're getting there, and it appears that the, sh that the Shroud of Turin is helping lead us to things like quantum physics. But I have here four pictures, the macroscope of the universe, a microscope, the earth, and the shroud face. And in the middle is the cross. It all comes down to the cross. Continue. Okay. You might ask me, how did, how did we get started? How did I get started with the Shroud of Turin? They call people like me Shroudies. Remember Star Trek? I bet a lot of you are Trekkies from Star Trek. Some of you are Shroudies, too. A shroudy is someone who has an unusual interest, passionate interest in the Shroud of Turin. And in 1980, I saw this magazine and it drew me in. So it began this way. On the cover, it says, The Mystery of the Shroud. That cover drew me in, and I saw on the cover an article on the Shroud of Turin. So I went there. My mother died that year in 1980, and I was kind of searching and wandering, and all of a sudden, the shroud uh, is displayed in the National Geographic article that really kind of blew me away. This was the starting point for me in 1980. I had to tell people what I was learning. Christian scientists, there are many of them who had great contributions to science who are also believers in the Bible. A lot of scientists will say, oh, uh, those individuals who may have been uh, the believers in the Bible, their contributions to science are nullified because of their belief in the Bible. Well, they would have to nullify Sir Isaac Newton, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Kelvin, 
and da Vinci. They would have to nullify their contributions to science because all of them were believers in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the most studied object in human history, the Shroud of Turin. Not the black holes of space, not the pyramids of Egypt, but a bloody, dirty, stained burial cloth. The most studied object in history. Some of those disciplines involved, forensic pathology, chemistry, physics, botany, hematology, the study of blood, history, geography, archaeology, biochemistry, microbiology, neurobiology, all disciplines of the shroud, geology, theology of course, and nuclear physics and many other disciplines, dozens and dozens, have brought their instruments and their expertise, scientific, scientific expertise, to bear on the cloth, the most studied object ever. Okay, the thing about the shroud is the words Go ahead. of Scripture match the weapons described in the Bible and those weapons in the Bible and the words of Scripture are what we see in the wounds of the man in the shroud. Roman instruments were used to wound him. The words of the Bible describe those instruments, and that's what we see in the wounds of the man in the shroud. Okay, what I would ask you this evening to be is to be intellectually honest, like Eve Delage. Who was Eve Delage? I'm glad you asked. He was a scientist during the turn of the century who operated out of France. And one of the things in uh, the timeline of the Shroud is, in 1898, the first photograph was taken. That's when they discovered the photographic properties of the Shroud. The cloth itself acts like a negative. When it's photographed, a positive image emerges. And we're gonna see those images in a second. But in 1902, Yves Delage and his buddies, women too, were uh, discussing the photographs taken in 1898 of the Shroud. And Yves Delage had the nerve to say, it's Christ. He was agnostic, many of the scientists, of course, uh, atheists, and he said, these images depict Jesus Christ. Well, they went crazy. They called him a lot of names. And here's what he said. If it were anyone else but Christ, there would be no contention. A religious question has been needlessly injected onto a problem which in itself is purely scientific, with the result that feelings have run high and reason has been led astray. If, instead of Christ, there were a question of some person like Sargon, Achilles, or one of the, no one would have thought of making an objection. Here's the honesty. I recognize Christ as a historical person, and I see no reason why anyone should be scandalized that there still exist material traces of his earthly life. An intellectually honest statement from someone who was not a Christian. And so whatever your thoughts are about the shroud, it's a fake. It's not a fake. Um, divest yourself of what you believe and take in tonight with truth. Go ahead. A real man, Carlton Kuhn, a distinguished ethnologist, had this to say about the man in the shroud. Whoever the individual representative may have been, he's the physical type found in modern times among Sephardic Jews and noble Arabs. This man places him in the Middle East. John Walsh has this to say. Only this much is certain. The Shroud of Turin is either the most awesome and instructive relic of Jesus Christ in existence, showing us in its dark simplicity how he appeared to men, or it is one of the most ingenious, most unbelievably clever products of the human mind and hand on record. It's one or the other. There's no middle ground. The Shroud of Turin is a real man. It's not a fake, not a forgery, not a hoax in any way. I won't even talk to anybody who insists that it's a fake. You know, a lot of people, they don't want to be confused with the facts and truth. Their mind's already made up. That's why I'm asking you to be intellectually honest with the information you receive tonight. He's a real man. 
He was really crucified. Uh, they did terrible things to him. It's either Jesus or a man crucified exactly like him, one or the other. Alan Adler says this, there's no laboratory test for Christness. We don't have his fingerprints. We have DNA on the shroud, but it's degraded, it's too old. We have blood type, type AB on the shroud, but there is no laboratory test for Christness. Now, my father was a criminal defense attorney, and he introduced a term to me called preponderance of evidence. And as we go through tonight, you're going to see that the preponderance of evidence, the weight of the evidence, weighs heavily in favor of the Shroud of Turin being the authentic burial cloth of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Okay, when we look at it, on the left is what it actually appears like on the Shroud. When a photograph is taken, on the right, that image comes out uh, in the dark room. The image on the right is a positive image, which meant Secundo Pia, who took the first photograph in 1898, photographed a negative on the cloth. There's nothing like it on the earth. There are many thousands of burial uh, uh, garments with blood, dirt, body rot, decay, nothing like it with an image on it, only one. And it's a photographic negative on the piece of cloth, and when that's photographed in the dark room, Secundo Pia said in 1898, when that face came out, in his solution, he almost dropped a large plate because it freaked him out. He thought for the first time in 19 centuries, he's looking at the face of Christ. The image on the shroud rests on the top two fibers of a thread. If you look at the cloth under a microscope, it's made of threads. Threads are made of fibers. A fiber is less in diameter than a human hair. Take a hundred of those fibers, wrap them up, and you have a thread. When you look at the shroud image, the shroud image is a, de uh, a decoloration of the image fiber. It's actually, it's been colored yellow. Something caused a yellowing of the top two fibers, less than two human hairs in thickness, on the surface of the shroud. If you took a razor blade and went on the top of it, you'd scrape the image away. The blood goes through to the back of the shroud. You can look underneath it and see the blood. It's soaked through. But the image rests on the top two fibers of a hundred. If you looked underneath those two yellowed fibers, you'd see 98 pure white fibers underneath that were not discolored. It's a surface phenomenon, and it's believed <coughs> that it came from light, that UV light created the image on the shroud, and the light came from the body. It wasn't reflected light, it wasn't external light, because there's three-dimensional information in the shroud, and that means the body gave forth the light that gave the three-dimensional information. There's height, width, and depth information on the shroud. And unfortunately, the older I get, my depth keeps getting depther and depther. But that's another story. Okay, let's continue. So we see when we look at the cloth, we see on either side of the body burn marks. It was in a fire in 1532. Probably, it was in a small little wooden church. Maybe someone knocked over a candle. The place went up in flames. This thing was rescued. But it was folded in a silver bejeweled box kept behind the altar and a drop of silver, which melts at 900 degrees, dripped into the box on one corner and you have these symmetrical burn marks that were created. Now if it was a painting, uh, silver melts at 900 degrees, what would have happened to the painting? It would have been completely destroyed. We know it's not a painting, but yet it has a yellowed, uh, a surface image on it. Now, when you look at it, you see the, the, the burn marks from the fire, and you see the white patches that were sewn on by poor Claire nuns two years later in 1534. Now, it's interesting that the, that the fire didn't come right down the center of the front and the center of the back, destroying the image. It's almost as if it was provi providentially framed, if you will. When we look at the photograph of the shroud, we see the positive image, but look at what's done to the burn marks. Can we go back, Joe? Okay, here we see the burns are dark and the patches are white. 
Go ahead. When we photograph it, the burns are white and the patches are dark. It, rever it reverses itself. Go back again, Joe. We see the spear wound in the left part of the chest, but in reality, it's in the right side. Remember when, back in the day, if there's any young people in here, you probably don't know what film is inside a camera. Now they take pictures with phones, they screwed everything up. But uh, that was a joke, folks, but anyway. Uh, what happens is that we see the images reverse themselves. There's an inversion process that takes place. What's dark on the cloth is light on the photograph, and vice versa. Go ahead. So here we see on the left the burn marks, the white patches, and the photograph on the right, and you see the different color of the burn, the white and the dark patches. Now, in the right wrist is a blood wound, but in reality, it inverts itself, inverts itself and it's on the left side uh, of the wrist, the left wrist. Okay. The back side, once again, the burn mark. Oh. The burn marks, the white patches, when we photograph it, the positive image, it reverse, uh, it, uh, the positions invert themselves, and uh, it's much more real, much more lifelike in the positive image than on the negative. For 19 centuries before the photograph, they looked at the shroud and it was called, it looked like a silhouette or ghostly looking. When, you, when you're in the room with the shroud and you're looking at it, you have to be about about 10 to 20 feet away to see it. If you're too far away, you can't make it out. Too close, you can't make it out. So if it was a, if it was a painting, the guy either had a long brush or a long arm uh, in order to make the painting. But we know it's not. And many were astonished at the, his visage, his face was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of man, more than the sons of men. They put this uh, photograph in a computer, and they sub said to the computer, subtract everything but the blood. Now, this thing's been rolled and unrolled full trees, and blood dries and flakes off and falls away. This is the blood that remains on the face after 20 centuries. Okay, we're going to look at how, how that face was marred. Go ahead. Bruised cheek. Under the, right eye, under the right eye, there's a large bruise and swelling under the right cheek. He was beaten in the face with fists and most likely sticks, too. The missing beard. There appears to be evidence that parts of the beard are missing. When Jesus said he was God, they said, what more need do we have of witnesses? This man blasphemes, and they ripped out parts of his beard. There appears to be evidence that parts of the beard are missing. The septum, uh, the bridge in the nose is crushed, broken. He was clubbed in the face, beaten in the face. You know, the Bible says the whole band of soldiers came out against Christ. And I looked that up. I said, how many are a band? Between five and 600 men came out, beaten him, spitting in his face. Was there a whole line of 500 men taking their turn, spitting at him, the next guy? I don't know, but it's, I shudder to, to think about it. Okay, keep going, Joe. Large blood flow. Go ahead, Joe, we have a, there we go. Okay, there's a three in the forehead. It's a large blood flow in the forehead. They've even been able to tell with the blood flow which flows came from venous blood, which flows came from arterial blood. Okay, the large uh, puncture wound in the forehead, uh, flows of blood on the, on the front from the crown of thorns. Medical doctors have said that these thorns would have invaded the central nervous system. They said man can't take this kind of pain. In normal situations, you'd pass out. Jesus didn't pass out. But in normal situations, the pain is so great, you'd pass out. Now, it invaded the central nervous system. Doctors have said there'd be radiating, lancinating pains like lightning bolts going through the body, all through the body. Um, and so, you know, what other man in history wore a crown of thorns? It was unique to Christ, yet this man also wore a crown of thorns. 
on the back of the head. Keep going, Joe. Blood flow from the crown of thorns. We can clearly see it. It was a helmet. And I have a, in the exhibit hall in the school, I have an example of it. But it was a skull cap of thorns. It wasn't a wreath or a circlet we normally see. It was a skull cap, like a helmet of thorns. And it was unique to Jesus. Yet this man also wore a helmet of thorns. Okay. Multiple scourge wounds on the back from the flagrum. Keep going, Joe. Okay. And the, in my studies, I found three different types of scourges that were used. One was made of sheep bones, sheep knuckles. And they sharpened them and they used that. They also used broken pottery. And they also used lead balls in the shape of barbells. The man in the shroud was scourged with the third, the lead balls that resembled barbells. And remember, each stroke, it was a satanic stroke on the back of Jesus. You know, in the Passion of the Christ, you saw him bent over to a small post, and they used something called a meat hook. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been used. That would have killed him on the spot. They were scourged before crucifixion. They didn't kill him on the way to the cross. They had to get to the cross to die. But Jesus was flogged, the man in the shroud was flogged between 100 and 200 times. Both sides of his body from his shoulders to his feet using a flagrum made of barbell-shaped balls of lead. Go ahead. No, go forward. Go ahead, go forward, okay. In the center, you see a white line in a rectangular box, and that white line may be a ponytail. His hair is gathered in the back. He has long hair, mustache, full mustache, full beard. Uh, and the diagonal lines you see, go ahead, Joe, uh, show abrasions on the shoulders. He carried the patibulum, which was the horizontal beam. It was tied on. And the victims were led away by the ankles with a rope on the, on the ankles. If one of them fell, they all fell like dominoes. This man carried a patibulum, the heavy beam. It would have weighed about 100 pounds. The stipes, the stipes, if you will, the vertical piece was waiting for him at the crucifixion site because they reused the vertical pieces over and over again. So he carried it. It was tied on. He would not have been able to break his fall. And there are excoriations on the back, a widening, a widening of the scourge wounds, suggesting something abrasive was rubbing wider. Lance wound in the side. Keep going, Joe. Okay. And the width of this lance wound in the side is about four centimeters wide. Is it a coincidence that the Roman spear is four centimeters wide? I have these instruments over at the school in, in, in the hall. Tomorrow morning they're going to be available for view if you're interested, uh, from about 10 to noon. Anyway, he was speared between the fifth and the sixth rib on the right side. And the interesting thing about this is this is post-mortem blood. It was, it, it, it was uh, issued after death. All the other blood was pre-mortem. This flow, medical doctors have said, was post-mortem blood. Okay. On the small of the back, okay, that's fine. You can stay there. From this spear wound in the side, go ahead. On the small of the back, keep going, Joe. Yeah. Uh, there's a pool of blood on the small of the back, above the buttocks, a large flow of blood that came from the spear wound. Okay, go ahead. His hands were crossed over the pelvic area. Nothing could be seen. Private area completely covered. Uh, he took a hole in the wrist with blood flowing on the forearms. Go ahead, Joe. His stomach was distended. It was swollen. What does that mean? It means he was struggling to breathe. You see, on the cross, your body slumps from the weight. 
You can take a shallow breath, but you can't exhale. You have to push up and pull up to exhale. That distended stomach is indicative of a man struggling to breathe. By the way, they crucified thousands and thousands and thousands of people over many, many years. So they knew how to crucify and make it last a long time. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay, so the blood flow on the forearms uh, match the two directions of the body on the cross. They flow in two directions on the forearms, the slumping and the raising. Now, think about it. This man was buried in an expensive piece of linen. That was unusual. If you were buried at all, a crucifixion victim, they did release the body to the family if they wanted it. But most victims were outcasts. They weren't claimed by the family, and they were thrown outside the city on a pile and let the animals, the birds of prey, the elements do their thing. Uh, this man was buried in an expensive piece of linen. Very unusual. Who was buried in linen? Or who wore linen back then? Priests? Kings? Jesus was both. He was also a prophet. But I don't think he wore camel hair like John did. Okay. Okay, so you see the hole in the wrist and the blood flow from the nail. Now, They've done studies with cadavers, bodies that weren't claimed to look and see the effects of crucifixion. They've driven nails through the palms of victims who weren't claimed. Within minutes, it rips, the body falls. Conclusion, can't crucify through the palm. Structures are not strong enough. But the original language of the Bible in the Old Testament, Hebrew, the word hand, chier, C-H-E-I-R, means fingertips to elbow. So it doesn't violate the original language of the scripture through the wrist. Now, it could have been right through the wrist, a space called the space of distow, through the carpal bones, not breaking any bones. Remember, not a bone will be broken of Jesus. The nose is cartilage, it's not bone, uh, the septum area. So it could have either been through the wrist with the exit wound in the back of the wrist, or if you take your thumb and your pinky and you touch them, there's a furrow that's made at the base of the palm. A nail could have went through that furrow and an exit wound out of the back side of the wrist. So he was nailed through the wrist, which are in uh, accordance with the uh, Scripture, Old Testament Scripture, what hand means. And um, you don't see any thumbs because when you drive a nail through the wrist, you seriously damage or sever the median nerve. And if any of you had carpal tunnel or know what carpal tunnel is all about syndrome, uh, you know what kind of pain we're talking about. Medical doctors have said this kind of pain you'd also pass out if it was intense enough. Uh, there's a study of... Uh, World War, World War I soldiers on the battlefield. Uh, one of the doctors who wrote a book on the shroud called Doctor at Calvary, uh, Pierre Barbet said, he was a field surgeon in World War I, and he'd say the wrist wound in the wrist, uh, they would give him pure morphine and it wouldn't do anything. They'd be screaming in agony. It'd be so painful. That's the wrist wound. We know about that, the wounds of the head. Jesus shouldn't have been conscious. Uh, when all this went on. You're not supposed to be able to withstand this kind of pain. Okay, blood flow on the feet. Here's the sole of the right foot completely covered in blood. The left foot is over the top of the right instep. He took one nail between both feet. Uh, in order to uh, uh, exhale, he has to pull up and push up to exhale. Okay, continue. So, we think we know who it is, and we think we know who done it. But one question remains. How did the image get there? 
That's the question. How did it get there? The blood got on the cloth by direct contact. Direct body contact, and the blood soaked into the cloth. When they put him in the tomb, it must have been all around him like glue stuck to the wounds. So how did the image get there? And Joseph of Arimathea bought fine linen. The shroud is fine linen, expensive linen. It's thought that it may have been manufactured north of Israel in Syria. And maybe the, the, uh, the temple um, clothing people, if you will, went up there and grabbed, uh, you know, uh, material for the temple, for the temple priests. Because Joseph of Arimathea bought fine linen. He bought it for somewhere, and where did they get it from? They might have got it from Syria. Bought fine linen, took him down from the cross and wrapped him in it. Laid him in the sepulcher, which was cut out of a rock, and rolled a stone to the door of the grave. So it was fine linen that Jesus was wrapped in. Very unusual. Nobody's on the cross is wrapped in fine linen. But this man was, and so was Jesus. The shroud linen. Now this is very interesting. It's 14 feet 3 inches long, 3 feet 7 inches wide. The shroud is a linen cloth woven in a 3 over 1 herringbone pattern and measures 14 3 by 3 7. Now look at this. These dimensions correlate, correlate with ancient Jewish measurements of 2 cubits by 8 cubits, consistent with loom technology of the period. The finer weave of 3 over 1 herringbone is consistent with the New Testament statement that the sindon or shroud was purchased by Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy man. The question is, why did it measure eight cubits by two cubits, which the Jews used in measurements, the cubit? Because it was measured for a Jewish man. It's that simple. It was measured for a Jewish man. That's why it measures eight by two. The image. The shroud images are scorch-like, yet not created by heat. We believe it was light, ultraviolet light, which came from the body itself. It wasn't external. It wasn't reflected. It has three-dimensional information. And our purely surface phenomenon limited to the crowns of the top fibers. Remember, I said if you took a razor blade, you'd scrape it away. STIRP, which is Shroud of Turin Research Project, the scientific team in 1978 that tested it and studied it, STIRP determined that the image was caused by rapid dehydration, oxidation, and degradation of the linen by an unidentified process, coloring it a sepia or straw yellow. The image appears to have been created by light. How does a dead body uh, become light? I don't know, but maybe the resurrection had something to do with it. Okay. If we say this may be the burial cloth of Christ, we have to take it back to the tomb. This, the historical aspect of the shroud, there are some gaps that we have to fill in with maybe a little conjecture, maybe a little speculation. But during, during the time of Christ, there was a king who lived north of Israel in a place called Edessa. Now it's called Urfa in Turkey. And this king, Abgar, heard Jesus was a ruler and a healer, and he sent word to Jesus to come and heal him. Evidently, he had an incurable sickness. Okay. Back up one second. I'm sorry. Okay. Abgar is holding in his hand a cloth that has a face image only, the face of Christ without getting into a lot of detail of this story, there are a couple of historical accounts of this story. But I just want to leave you with this, that Abgar was given by one of the disciples, Jude Thaddeus, who was a disciple of Thomas the Doubter. He carried with him a face cloth with an image on it and gave it to Abgar. It was called the image of Edessa. In Greek, it was known as archaeopoitos, which means image not made with human hands. He brought this image to Abgar. Now, I want you to notice that 
The, the face image is longer horizontally than it is vertically. That's important here in a few slides. Okay, so there was a face cloth that was brought to Abgar with the miraculous image not made with hands of Jesus on it. And so we see that over the years, the Mandelian, as it, it was called, the image of Edessa, not made with human hands, it was always depicted more horizontal than vertical. Okay, I want you to keep that here. The shroud. When you fold the shroud four times, the word tetradiplon means doubled four times, folded four times. The word tetradiplon was used for the shroud, and the word tetradiplon was used for the image of Edessa. When you fold it four times, that's what you get. A disembodied head wider than vertical. We believe the Shroud of Turin is the image of Edessa, later discovered to be a full-length cloth, but it was disguised when given to Abgar. They wouldn't have run out of the tomb, the disciples saying, look what we found. It had bloody uh, issue on it, and it, uh, it, 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 it covered a condemned man. They had every reason not to touch it, because it's taboo in the Jewish faith to touch something that was, it was, you know, was covered a corpse, especially one convicted of a crime and put to death. So that's what we have. We have a, a, a wider than, than vertical shroud, which appears to be what we see on the image of Edessa. So over the years, you would see they, they folded the shroud up, and when you look at a painting in the upper right-hand corner, you see the face in the middle, you see a wider aspect than vertical. And we believe that what Abgar was given was the cloth folded and disguised, and it wasn't discovered until many centuries later. Joe, okay. This image of Edessa disappeared shortly after Abgar received it because one of his sons was a pagan and he was persecuting Christians and destroying relics and artifacts and things like that. So it disappeared for almost 500 years and it was rediscovered after a flood of the city of Edessa above the Western Gate in 525, the image of Edessa was rediscovered. They believe it was bricked up there to protect it from Abgar's son who might have destroyed it. That's important because before this was rediscovered, all the paintings, mosaics, uh, uh, frescoes in the catacombs, when they showed Jesus up till this time, he was always boyish looking, curly hair, no beard, youthful, Roman-like. But after this was rediscovered, all of a sudden, the images of Christ completely changed. And we'll show you this here in a second. Okay. The, the picture on the left shows Christ uh, in the catacombs, uh, early 4th century. He's uh, healing the woman with the issue of blood. He's got curly hair and he's beardless. In the middle, curly haired and beardless, a mosaic. And on the, on the right, also, uh, no beard and... Uh, we're talking about the fourth century. These uh, depictions of Christ without long hair, without a mustache, without a beard, without the owlish eyes and the long nose. Prior to the sixth century, after the rediscovery of the image of Edessa above the Western Gate, all of a sudden, everything changed. The, owl, the eyes became owlish looking, like the man in the shroud. Long nose. Uh-oh. Long nose. Don't scare me like that, Joe. Okay. Long nose, long hair, beard. Same thing on the right side. This is, this is sixth century on the left side. On the, on the right side, that's eighth century. Everything changed. And there's one picture you're going to see now that really shows these changes. Go ahead. And this is Christ Pantocrator. This was uh, made in the 6th century. 
It's at St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of Mount Sinai in Egypt. And when you take this and you look at the face on the, on the right, you say to yourself, the man who painted this had to be looking at that face in order to paint it. Sixth century, 525 maybe, when it's rediscovered above the Western Gate. It all changed. There's even coins. This is seventh century. The Emperor Justinian, the Byzantine Emperor, minted a coin. The left is the face of Christ. The right is that face on the coin over the face of the shroud. It all lines up. Not only did painters use, we believe, the shroud face for their paintings, we believe that uh, the one who minted these coins for Justinian was also looking at the shroud face to make the coin, 6th century. So from the tomb to Turin, let's look at this. Keep, go ahead, Joe, one at a time. After the resurrection, the disciple Thaddeus carries a cloth to King Abgar. The cloth becomes known as the image of a destined Mandelian, the face cloth only. After Abgar's death, 50 AD, the cloth disappears due to the persecution from his second son. The image of Odessa is rediscovered above the western gate after the city was flooded. From 525 onward, the image of Odessa Mandelian was venerated as the face of Christ in the city of Edessa. And it also, oh, the word tetradiplone was used to describe it in the 6th century when it was rediscovered, which seems like, why would it be doubled in four? This is only a face cloth. Keep going. So in 943 AD, the Byzantine army came to Edessa, which is now under Muslim control, and they demanded this Christian relic be given to them. Or, here are your choices. We'll destroy the city and kill everybody. Or if you give it to us, we'll give you 200 uh, coins of silver and we'll free 200 prisoners. So they wisely gave it up. So in 943, the Byzantine emperor came and he got it. And uh, when he rescued the cloth, he brought it back to uh, Constantinople, and the word tetradiplone was used to describe it in 944. It's taken to Constantinople, and it's there until 1204, the image of Edessa, the face cloth, which is now known to be a full-length burial cloth. There was a bishop in Constantinople who said, we've seen the full imprint of Christ's body on the image of Edessa. Spear wound and everything, he testified, it's written down. And so it was there from 943 to 1204. In 1204, during the Fourth Crusade, uh, Constantinople is sacked by the Western Church, they sacked the Eastern Church, and they stole everything they can get their hands on. The image of the shroud is uh, rediscovered uh, well, for 150 years it was missing, and then it's rediscovered. And in 1357, it's publicly exhibited at a church in Loray. It's owned by a family. They're known as Geoffrey de Charnay. And in 1453, Geoffrey de Charnay's granddaughter gave the shroud in exchange for income to last the rest of her life. She gave it to the House of Savoy, the ruling family in Italy and southern France. They had areas of southern France and northern Italy that they ruled. Now the ruling monarchy of the region is given the cloth. Go ahead. Keep going. So in 1532, while it's housed in a church in Chambray, uh, it's in a fire. And that's where the burn marks came from. And if it was a painting, it would have melted. So 1534, poor Claire nuns of France, they sewed the backing cloth on and patches on the damaged shroud. In 1578, it was moved over the Alps to Torino. The reason it was moved over there is there was a guy named Carlos of Borromeo, St. Charles of Borromeo, who was planning to walk from Milan over the Alps to Chambray to see it. And the House of Savoy brought it over the Alps to Turin to shorten his journey. So, 1898, the first photograph is taken. That's the camera that's used, uh, that was used, and that's when the photographic properties were discovered. 
All right, I just gave you some history. Now we're going to move into science, and I'm going to finish with a little theology. Okay, this is 1978. This is St. John the Baptist Cathedral, where it's been since 1578. Uh, the quay, you can see it going down the street, thousands of people waiting to get into the church for about a 90-second glimpse. I've seen it twice. I saw it in 1998. I saw it in 2000. I was with the Worldwide Press in 1998. Uh, I got an opportunity to spend about 45 minutes with it, me and the Worldwide Press. And um, I also saw it in 2000. It was brought out for Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. And um, they're not pl planning to bring it out again until 2025, which is only a few years away. But in 1978, after the pilgrims got an opportunity to see it, the shroud was given to Sturt, the Shroud of Turin Research Project, for five 24-hour round-the-clock days to test it, but not to use any material. They couldn't take or destroy any material. As long as their tests were non-destructive, they could test it. That's been the only testing to date. Yes. <clears throat> They're un unwrapping it, putting it on a table. It was wrapped in red silk. The gentleman in the middle, John Jackson, he led the team. He's a theoretical physicist. He's become a good friend of mine. I spent some time with him a few years ago, him and his wife, at his laboratory in Colorado Springs. Also, Barry Schwartz, who took the documenting, he was a documenting photographer, a friend of mine, spent time at his house doing research. Uh, I never thought I'd get to know these guys, uh, but they become friends, and uh, I'm pretty connected with the Shroud crowd. They call it the Shroud crowd. Some of the organizations involved in the testing, uh, Lockheed, U.S. Air Force Weapons Lab. If we go down Los Alamos, that developed the atomic bomb, uh, Nuclear Technology Lab, all kinds of U.S. Air Force Academy, Jet Propulsion Lab that works on space missions. The most sophisticated laboratories with their equipment and with the expertise of the scientists came to Turin in 78 saying, give us five minutes, we'll prove it a fake. It's been a long five minutes. Smoothing out the wrinkles, they said it was remarkably supple and soft for something possibly 2,000 years old. So they're looking under the backside for the first time in 400 years, and that's when they said, hey, the image doesn't go through. It's only on the top two fibers. The blood goes through to the backside, but not the image. Type AB. Further examination of the underside. This gentleman on the left here, Dr. Ray Rogers, he was kind of a lightweight chemist, thermal chemist at Los Alamos developing atomic bombs. This guy, you know, he thinks he knew something. But anyway, he wrote a paper debunking the carbon dating. You see, the carbon dating came out in 1988. They took a sample from the most highly contaminated area of the shroud, which was proven after the test to be part of a reweave from the Middle Ages. They violated all the protocol for taking the sample, went to the most damaged area, took the sample from that site, which they vowed they wouldn't do, but they did, and it was part of a reweave discovered later uh, from what material? Material that was added to the shroud after the fire of 1532. It's medieval, but not for the main body of the shroud. But when it was tested, the scientists said 1260 to 1390, Look at these smug scientists with their arms crossed. It says three labs performed independent carbon dating tests on the shroud in 1988. They concluded the shroud dated between 1260 and 1390, was medieval in origin, and was therefore not old enough to have, been, to have wrapped the body of Jesus. Their conclusion was generally accepted around the world. All the papers, France, Germany, Italy, you name it, shrouds of fake, shrouds of hoax, shrouds of forgery. Only until later did we discover they took the sample from a contaminated area, which was part of a reweave. So Ray Rogers wrote a paper just before he died. And here's what he said. <clears throat> the paper concludes, the combined evidence from blah, 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 proves that the material from the radiocarbon area of the shroud is significantly different from that of the main cloth. The radiocarbon sample was thus not 
part of the original cloth and is invalid for determining the age of the shroud. How often have you heard that from the media? If it ain't negative, it ain't news, right? So this has been put to, put to rest. We know why it dated medieval. It has no reflection on the main body of the cloth. Okay, so I'm looking at uh, sticky tape samples that were lifted off the surface of the shroud in 1973 and 1978. All I wanted to do when I started studying this was read an article in the National Geographic. And I found myself in the, in the basement of a, a researcher and his wife in North Carolina looking at tape samples lifted off the surface of the shroud. They put scotch tape on the shroud lifted it off, mounted it on microscopic slides. You have evidence caught between the threads, between the fibers that you can't get any way, any other way. So he mounted those slides, uh, that tape on slides, and you can look at it under a, under a microscope. And you're gonna see some of the things that I'm holding right here. Okay, I think we got an arrow coming, three of them, Joe. One, two, three, okay. The arrow in the right-hand corner on the bottom, that's a pollen grain, a pollen grain. You're going to see a close-up of it in a minute from a thorn pollen in the head region. Grows only in Israel, and it blooms March and April of the year during Easter. Isn't that interesting? Thorn pollen called Gondalia turniforti. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you see the red silk up there. It was wrapped in silk. This is, this is on scotch tape. And then you see in the middle a bunch of fibers, yellowed fibers. You can see through those fibers. The yellowing of the fiber doesn't go into the medulla, into the center of the fiber. It's only on the circumference of the fiber. And the coloration on the front of the body is, the exa is exactly the same as the back of the body. It's the same monotone color. On the front of the body, all you have is the cloth touching it, but on the bottom half of the cloth, you have 180 pounds glued on the body. How do we get the same color? I'll talk about that in a moment. And then, well, I, I did all three. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is what the uh, pollen, or the, the plants look like. I have specimens over in the exhibition hall, if you care to come over tomorrow morning and see it. Uh, but these were nasty. They were about, about two inches long, and I read one uh, part of my research where they use these as nails, use them as nails. And so remember, Jesus was beaten on the head. The crown was beaten into his head with the reed that they, the scepter they put in his hand. Go ahead. Here's a Gundalia turniforti thorn pollen. Now, this is microscopic. If it was a medieval forger, how would he or she, ladies, could have been a she, uh, have known about pollen before the invention of the microscope? How could he have known? Or she? Couldn't have. So this is pollen. You can only see it with a microscope. But look at the spines. See them? Going all the way around this microscopic piece of pollen. Medieval forger would never have known about this. Real blood, type AB. Uh, a couple of wackos out there wrote a book a couple decades ago saying, hey, let's, let's clone the man in the shroud using the blood. There are, there are a few DNA segments that were uncovered, but it's too degraded, it's too old, and it can't be done. I don't think the father would allow it, do you? But anyway, real blood, type AB, which, by the way, in the world is the least uh, known blood type, but in the Jewish world, about 18 to 20 percent of Jews have type AB blood. So it works for a Jewish man, not for most of the rest of us. Okay, it's blood. Oh, back up one second. The gentleman looking through the microscope, Dr. John Heller, uh, in his undergraduate degree, he went to a school called Western Reserve that became Case Western Reserve. Go ahead.
Okay, and once again, it's got three arrows, Joe. Okay, once again, we see on a slide the thorn pollen on top, a fiber shard, and a blood speck. And when I saw that blood, ladies and gentlemen, under a microscope, I couldn't get my eyes off it. I kept, and it, by the way, it's, it's reddish, it's carmine in color still. And the reason is because when someone is tortured, the blood releases a component, it breaks down, it's called bilirubin, which makes the blood bright red. The reason the blood in the shroud is bright red, which many of them said can't be, it should be black or brown, not unless you're tortured. When you're tortured, a component is released in the blood called bilirubin, which makes the blood bright red. The reason it's bright red on the shroud is because he was tortured. The man was really tortured. But when I looked at that blood, I kept staring at it. I couldn't get my eyes off it. And I said to myself, am I looking at the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world? Remember, all I wanted to do was read a magazine article. Travertina aragonite on the feet of the man. How's this for forensic evidence? Like the pollen? Travertina aragonite, jo Joseph Kolbeck. Uh, from the Institute, examined some dirt particles from the shroud surface. The dirt was found to be travertine aragonite limestone. Using a high-resolution microprobe, SETI and Colbeck compared the spectra of samples taken from the shroud with samples of limestone from ancient Jerusalem tombs. The dirt on the feet of the man in the shroud came from dirt found only in Jerusalem. The chemical signatures of the shroud sample and the tomb limestone were found identical except for minute fragments of cellulose linen fiber that could not be separated from the shroud samples. Dirt particles are on the nose, on the left knee, and the feet, and they come from the limestone quarries of Jerusalem, and a specific signature, travertine aragonite, comes from one place on the earth. How would a medieval forger before the invention of the microscope, know about pollen and this dirt without a microscope. Can't be done. How's that for forensic evidence? Transmitted light. When you shine a light through the back of the shroud, you don't see the image. If it was a painting, you'd see it. The only thing you see is the blood. You see the spear wound on the right next to the patch, the white patch. You see the blood on the arms, crossing the arms. Go to the next slide. The backside, you see on the small of the back, the blood, and there's scourge, blood marks all over that, but you don't see an image. The reason you don't see an image is it's not a painting. If it was, it would have showed up. What's not on the cloth? No inorganic pigment present. No substances that were manually applied to the cloth. No artistic substances like paint detected. No binder, nothing cementing the fiber. The blood causes the threads in the fiber to cement. But the image, you can pick up a fiber with a needle and look underneath, not cemented together. <clears throat> no brush strokes. No brush strokes. And if it was a painting, they could tell if the painter was right-handed or left-handed, depending on the direction of the br uh, brush strokes. No stains, dyes, or artificial medium. Okay. Now, there appear to be button-like objects over the eyes. A number of years ago, I said these were Roman coins. They might be Roman coins, but we just don't know for sure. Barry Schwartz, the documenting photographer, strongly encouraged me not to say that they're medieval or, uh, Roman coins. So I won't. But I will say there are button-like objects over the eyes it may be coins, or maybe shards, uh, pottery shards, or maybe pebbles to keep the lids closed in depth. Three-dimensional information. The image projects outward. They know how far away his eye sockets were from the cloth that passed over, because the image is made up of dehydrated and oxidized fibers. If the cloth was touching the nose, which it was, you had all of these fibers discolored. But in the eye socket, the eye socket is white. You have far fewer eye, or, uh, fibers discolored in the eye sockets. It 
whatever discolored the, 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 the image on the shroud, it acted through space over time. A very short space in a very, very, very short period of time. Again, 3D enhancement. You can clearly see the calves sticking out, the thighs, the legs. It, it's projected outward. This is three-dimensional information. Only one photograph on the Earth is three-dimensional. If they put your photograph or mine in the VP8 image analyzer that came up with the 3D information, it would be completely distorted. We wouldn't even be able to recognize our own face. Only one photograph is three-dimensional, the Shroud of Turin. Okay, and that's what we see. We see three-dimensional information in the side view of the head there. Okay, now I'm going to show you a couple of slides here. And the last one I'm going to show you, you're going to gaze at it for a few moments while I get a drink of water. But the three-dimensional information, you can clearly see the, pec the pectoral muscles of the man in the shroud. You see the arms appears to be uh, standing away from the cloth itself. And the face, there's a lot of damage in the face, a lot of damage, but we're going to eliminate some of that damage and see what it looks like. So on the left side of the face is the damage cleared away. On the right side, the damage has not been cleared away. The next slide you're about to see is the face without the damage. One more, Joe. With the damage cleared, that's what the face looks like. At Christmas, we recite the words of Isaiah. We said he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of and that's what we see on the shroud. That even in his torturous death could not overcome who he truly is. Okay, Joe. When I was in Israel a few years ago, I came upon this stone and it was used to crush olives. A beast of burden would walk around in a circle, it would crush the olives and you'd catch it in a jar or a vase, the oil. In the garden, Gethsemane means the place of crushing. Like olives that are crushed with the stone, Jesus was crushed in the garden. And Luke describes it. Only Luke, the physician, describes it. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Hematidrosis. Luke, the physician, describes it. This is a real medical condition. We saw it during the Holocaust. When an individual knows they are doomed, they're going to die real soon. No way out. When they know they're doomed, the capillaries, smallest blood vessels, burst inside, mixed with sweat, and bloody sweat falls to the ground. Luke was describing a real medical condition that can be seen rarely when someone knows they're about to die and they're doomed. We've got a little uh, problem here. Huh? Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Betrayed and arrested. Then the, okay. All right. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. 
and they led him away to the high priest. Remember I said a band is between five and 600 soldiers hitting him, spitting on him, mocking him. There was no resistance whatsoever. The thing that amazed me about the Shroud of Turin and the image is there was no attempt by the man in the shroud to defend himself. No defensive struggle. No attempt to fight back or defend himself. No fight or flight response. That would be the normal response. If we're getting whipped or we're getting roughed up, we're going to fight, we're going to do what we can to prevent that from happening. And if he did, we would see it on the cloth. But there was no attempt. It's almost as if he did it willingly, on purpose, like a lamb. Deliver to Pilate and straightway. Oh, okay. Okay. There must be a tremendous blessing going on here today because the devil wants to interrupt this thing. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. He was scourged and condemned. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas to them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. You know, in the Bible we read things like, and they scourged him, and they crucified him. But what did that mean? What did that mean? This was a horrific thing that happened. If we saw what Jesus looked like in his passion, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, we would vomit. We would have vomited if we saw him. He was so revolting to look at. Keep going. Keep going. Bar means son of. Bar Abba, the son of the father, was exchanged released in place of the Son of the Father. I don't think that was an accident. Barabbas, the name, Bar Abba, means Son of the Father, exchanged for capital Son of the Father. That wasn't a, an accident. That was purposeful. And I just realized that a few years ago, I thought, my goodness, the name Barabbas means Son of the Father. That's who Jesus is. I believe he was scourged with his hands above his head to a pillar. You saw the passion of the Christ, Jesus, being scourged to a low post. The, the wounds on the man in the shroud are so perfect, both sides, that he had to have his hands above his head. The angle of the strokes are different on the shroud, suggesting one man was taller than the other. There's between 100 and 200 marks on the shroud. Medical doctors have said they don't know how he made it to the cross alive. And that's the flagrum. There you see the lead balls. And look at the wounds on the back side. They match the uh, lead barbell-shaped balls of lead. He was scourged with barbell-shaped balls of lead. And remember, every stroke, in my opinion, was satanic. If you or I got hit once, we wouldn't be getting up. We'd say, you'd have to drag me near the cross. Jesus willed himself there, purposely. And they clothed him with purple, plated a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. Keep going. It was a helmet. It wasn't a wreath or a circle. Maybe they put a rope on it, pulled it down. They beat him on the head when he was crowned, the scripture says, being driven deeper into the central nervous system. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't even imagine the pain. They said, a wisp of wind coming by your face, you'd scream in agony. Scream just by a little gentle breeze passing by. The patibulum was on the back, tied on, 
can't break the fall. The tip of his nose is missing with dirt ground in it. Dirt on the left knee, no skin, dirt in the feet. Travertine aragonite. If one of them fell, they all fell like dominoes because they were tied together at the ankles. The words of Jesus, I'm poured out like water. I'm seriously dehydrated. And all my bones are out of joint. My, my heart is like wax. It's melted in the midst of my bowels. What that means is I have nothing left. I have nothing left. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue sticks to my jaws. You have brought me into the dust, for dogs have encompassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. David, King David, spoke these words a thousand years before Jesus. They have pierced my hands and my feet. He was speaking prophetically the words of Jesus in Psalm 22, a thousand years before crucifixion. So they put the nail through the wrist. It would have either seriously damaged or severed the median nerve. I mentioned earlier, uh, those of you who may know about uh, uh, carpal tunnel, you'll know what that feels like. Um, terrible. He's got, you only see four fingers. You don't see five because when you damage the median nerve, which controls the flexion and extension of the thumb, it goes into the palm. How would a medieval, medieval forger have ever known this anatomically? You have four hands, or four fingers, uh, on each hand. And the, the fingers are long. They're very long. Why is that? Because you're seeing there's an x-ray quality to the man of the shroud with the right equipment. You're seeing the bones in the fingers all the way through the back of the wrist, the back of the hand to the wrist. That's why the bones are so long. There's an x-ray quality to those images showing you the full length of the fingers through the back of the hand. Then came the soldiers and broke the legs of the first and the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers with his spear pierced his side, and immediately there came out blood and water. Why did he pierce him in the side? Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Here we see, that's a little low, of that picture on the right. He was speared between the fifth and the sixth rib, and the spear would have went into the right atrium, which fills with blood after death. So after Jesus died, the right atrium was filled with blood. The spear wound went through the fifth and sixth rib into the right atrium. Blood is thicker than water. When he pulled it out, the blood came first, followed by the water in the pleural cavity. Anatomically, medically, this makes sense. And why was he speared and his legs weren't broke? For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him will not be broken. Medical doctors have said they've never seen an image more damaged, a, a, an individual, than the man in the shroud. Never have they, to, to a man and a woman, doctor, we've never seen a corpse more damaged than the man in the shroud. But there were no broken bones. This amazed them. How could this man not have any broken bones with all this damage? The nose is flattened, but this is cartilage. It's not bone. He was taken down from the cross, and he'd have been wrapped in that fashion, 14 feet long, 8 cubits long. Body in the bottom half brought over the top of the head to the feet, and they'd have wrapped around the, the ankles, the knees, uh, to keep the cloth next to the body. He was taken down from the cloth and wrapped in fine linen. Okay. That's a pretty blue, you must admit. Uh, now, there's another cloth I have to tell you about. A lot of people don't know about this. It's called the Sudarium of Oviedo. Then comes Simon Peter following him, went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lie in the napkin. Remember that word. That was about his head. Not lying with the linen cloth, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, John, because Peter went in first, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Now, before we go to the next one, I want you to see these two words, saw and believed. 
at the beginning, we talked about where science meets faith. And people will say, oh, science and faith, you can't uh, connect the two. Oh, yes, you can. When John went into the tomb, observation, science, right? Observation. He saw what's caused what? Faith to come. And he believed. Science and faith doing this. Don't ever let anyone tell you that they don't, uh, that they don't uh, belong together. Okay, so the Sudarium of Oviedo is another cloth in Oviedo, Spain. It's been there since the 7th century. We believe it came from Jerusalem. All it has is bloody stains on it and pleural fluid from the body. It's about the size of a large dish towel. It has no image on it. We believe it was a hood placed around Jesus' head in death. You know, back then, just like now, you don't look at the face of a corpse. There's nothing dignified. You, you cover it up. They did it back then, too. There's a Jewish law that you don't look at the face of a dead man, especially who was condemned, that it's sacrilegious, if you will. So you cover it up. So there's this cloth in existence. It's got type AB blood on it. And when you superimpose these stains over the face, the nose and the mouth of the man in the shroud, they do this. They line up specifically. It's believed that the hood was placed over the head so that it would hide the face, and it was also used to collect the blood and the fluid pouring out of the orifices of the face. So it would have been placed on his head in this position, and when they got to the tomb, they would took it off, rolled it up, put it over here because you have to bury everything that had the lifeblood with the body, Jewish law. But it was not on the face when he was enveloped in the full shroud. It was already in the tomb. So it only had blood and fluid. Blood on the sudarium. When analyzed, the blood type determined to be AB, uh, matches to the shroud. Traces of pollen correspond to the historical route of the shroud. Okay, so we believe that this cloth, when placed over the face of the man in the shroud, the nose and the mouth, and it would have been held there as they carried him to the tomb, it would have been held there because there are fingerprints on that cloth of the person who was holding it next to the face. But that's what, and then it was taken off and it was put over here. Now, I don't know if this is really true. It goes both ways. I've, I've read stories that, that agree with this, and I read things that said, no, that really didn't happen. But according to what I've read, the master of the house, the Jewish man who was the master of his home, if he'd have a meal and he was getting up maybe from the meal to maybe use the restroom. He would fold his napkin and place it over here, and the servant would say, he's returning because it's folded. If he were leaving, he'd wipe his beard, mustache, and just throw it in a clump, and they'd, he'd know that now's the time to uh, you know, take care of the table. But if he folded it up neatly and put it here, the servant knew that he's returning. Well, the Sudarium of Oviedo was carefully folded and placed over here. Was Jesus giving us a message? I don't know. It's kind of neat to think about it. Okay. Then he said to Thomas, reach hither your finger, behold my hands, reach hither your hand and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. Blessed are they this day, Saturday, April, uh, March 26th, at St. Monica's Church, who have not seen and yet have believed. Does the Shroud of Turin enable us to see our faith? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Is that what happened with the man in the shroud, in the tomb? Was he changed? Because this is a light image that created the cloth. Characteristics of image formation. It's three-dimensional, height, width, and depth, and it has holographic information. Now, I don't know a whole lot about holograms, but I know that when you make them, you need laser beams to dissect each other at various angles of the same image. You need a laser beam to make a hologram. The shroud is three-dimensional. Okay, let's keep going. Joe getting a little ahead of me there, buddy. Okay. Uh, what else do we see? Well, about 10 years ago, scientists in Italy were able to duplicate the color on one fiber of a thread using a laser beam. They were able to discolor a fiber like the shroud using a laser beam. That laser beam lasted one forty billionth of a second. Go ahead, Joe. And it took two to five billion watts of power to do it. They said they don't think there's enough power in the universe to duplicate the shroud image, at least by man's attempt. Particle radiation at the subatomic level. Continue. Okay. Uh, we believe it was ultraviolet. There's also X-ray qualities uh, to the man in the shroud. So there was radiation there. Radiation increases the carbon content. So if this thing dated medieval, if it is created, if it was created by the resurrection, the carbon would be added to the cloth, making it much younger than it actually is. And radiation enriches the brightness of the blood, the bilirubin. Remember I said when someone's tortured, that, that the blood issues a component, breaks it down, and it's bilirubin, bright red. The particle radiation, if he did rise from the dead, it would have made that blood bright redder. Uh, bright redder. Bright red. Redder, not bright. Okay. The light source came from the body itself. It wasn't reflected. Keep going. Okay. The blood projected outward and lifted cleanly away from the body. Now the cloth was glued to the body when they put it in the tomb. Keep going. The blood intersected with the falling cloth. The blood was on the cloth before the image was formed. They've taken blood fibers and cleaned the blood, and the fiber is pure white. It wasn't discolored, which means the blood was on the cloth before the image formed, which makes sense. No body decomposition. It, body breaks down about day four in the tombs of Israel. This thing left the tomb less than four days. Three, maybe? Collimated radiation, perpendicular to the body. The body would have been on a stone slab, horizontal. Radiation was straight up and straight down. It didn't come out of the side of the body, and it didn't come out of the top of the head. Now, how does the body may have been suspended between the upper and the lower cloth? It may have been levi levitating. Remember I mentioned earlier the image on the front half of the cloth, only the cloth was touching the body. But the bottom half of the cloth, it had 180 pounds of weight on the cloth. So how could there be the same color on both sides? Well, if the body was levitating, and then the top half and the bottom half popped off the body, popped off, and the top half and the bottom half acted like photographic plates, and in a millisecond of time, the body radiated and singed, even though that's the wrong word, the top two fibers of the front and the top two fibers of the back side. The body may have been levitating, and the top and bottom acted like photographic plates. Monochrome, same color on the entire shroud. And the body vanished beneath, beneath the falling cloth. It, it's called the collapse theory. It collapsed right through the body, and the body was nowhere to be found. 
Go ahead, Joe. Notable suggestions. I have a few more slides and I'm done. Dr. John Jackson, Colorado Shroud Center, suggests that a form of collimated radiation, straight up, straight down, perpendicular to the body, is the best explanation for how the image was formed, leaving a scorch-like appearance, a scorch caused by light versus heat, as the image does not fluoresce. By the way, I, I forgot to mention this. On all the blood flows, there's a serum halo. When you skin your knee, very quickly, within minutes, the, the, the wound will start to retract, and an oozing of, of, of pure liquid comes out, that serum. It shows up under ultraviolet light. The blood wounds show serum halos under ultraviolet light. This is, you know, blood chemistry 101. How would a medieval forger before the invention of a microscope, have known about serum before it was discovered. It can't be done. So, Dr. F Thomas Phillips, nuclear physicist, had this to say. A potential milliburst of radiation, a neutron flux, could be consistent with the moment of resurrection. Such a milliburst might cause the purely surface phenomenon with scorch light, scorch like, scorch by light images, and possibly add carbon to the clot. And if it did add carbon, it would date much younger than it actually is. Keep going. Uh, Kevin Moran, I knew Kevin, and he's not here anymore. It suggested that the image was formed when a high energy particle struck the fiber, like fiber optics, and released a radiation uh, release radiation within the fiber at a speed greater than the local speed of light. Kevin Moran. Sturt, Shroud of Turin Research Project. This was their concluding statement 40 years ago, and it's the same now as it was then. We can conclude for now that the shroud image is that of a real human form of a scourged, crucified man. It is not the product of an artist. The blood stains are composed of hemoglobin and also give a positive test for serum albumin. The image is an ongoing mystery and until further chemical studies are made, perhaps by this group of scientists or perhaps by some scientists in the future, the problem remains unsolved 40 years later. C.S. Lewis had this to say. By the way, C.S. Lewis at one time was an atheist. He debated Christians often and won many times. Doesn't say much for the Christians, but anyway, C.S. Lewis said this when he converted. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people, people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. Keep going. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You could spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you could fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. What an intellectually honest statement from a man who used to be an atheist. Keep going. Okay. A few more slides and I'm done. You know, Jesus is a gift. He's a gift to the world that must be received. For God so loved the world that he gave the gift of his only begotten Son. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. It's a gift. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment of our peace was on him, and with his stripes were healed. He didn't do anything wrong. He did nothing wrong. And he took all the punishment. 
He took all your punishment and mine on his body. Willingly. Now, I'm not a gambler, but I'll tell you, I'll take that deal. You'll take all my filth, and if only I believe in you, I could have everlasting life. I'll take that deal, deal 10 out of 10 times. Salvation is a free gift, but you must ask for it. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me. He asked the Lord to remember him. And Jesus said, today you're with me. Like this young lady, the scripture says, but to as many as received him the gift, if you don't open the gift and receive it, it's still a gift waiting to be opened. To them who received the gift, he gave power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus said this. These are the words of Jesus. And people get a little freaked out when they hear this, but I'll explain it. It's nothing we should be freaked out about. Jesus said, you have to be born again. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you have to be born again, or you can't see the kingdom of God. Now, keep going. If we confess with our, our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I want to draw your attention to the word and shall believe in your heart. Being born again is a heart condition. We need a heart transplant. And I know many of you in here have been born again for many, many, many years. All it means is you've given him your heart. T today, we should give him more than yesterday. Tomorrow, more than today. Here's what it says. Jesus said, people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. A broken and a contrite heart, oh God you will not despise. It's a heart matter. And, and that's all it is. That's what it means to be born again, that he's in our hearts. And I trust from the majority of us here, he is in our hearts. But there may be some who've come and they're just learning for the first time. Because if he took all our sins and he gave us everything he has, doesn't he deserve everything we have? I think so. So, as we near the end of this presentation, the question is asked, whom do you say the man in the shroud is? A mere man or the Lamb of God? You see, at one point, Abraham was ready to offer his son Isaac. But God stopped him. He saw himself, and that was enough. Abraham was blessed. And there came a time down the road where God spoke of Jesus as being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so Jesus says this. God says this to us. And this really kind of kills me, really. God takes all our sin, all our filth, takes all the pain of our punishment on his body, willingly, because he loves you so deeply. You are, if, you ever, if you never thought you were valued, look at this, what he did for your, for your soul. Your, a human soul is of immense value. And so God says, reason with me. God says, reason with me. You're guilty. I'll take everything. Just believe. Give me your heart. The scripture says this, and it's written on the shroud of Turin in blood. Though your sins are as scarlet and the blood's on the cloth, keep going. The resurrection image says they'll be white as snow. This is written on the cloth. Though they be red like crimson, your sins, and they're still there, the blood on the cloth, They'll be as wool. 
those scriptures are there. Amazing. A couple more slides. When I was in St. Louis, I delivered a paper in 2014 called The Shekinah Glory of the Lord in the Shroud of Turin. You can read it online. One of the presenters at the end of the uh, presentation showed this slide. And when I looked at that face on the right, for the first time, I gasped. I gasped. And I said to myself, Joe, Joe, that's a lion. I said, that looks like a mane to me. And then it hit me. Wait a minute. The man on the shroud is the lamb. The resurrection image on the same cloth manipulated by the person who made this image, we see a lion. And it kind of makes sense to me. Because the first time he came, he came as the lamb, led to the slaughter. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't fight back. He went as the lamb. You know, they missed his first coming. There were all kinds of signs. Virgin shall give birth, bear a son, born in Bethlehem, and they missed it. And he said, I'm going to come again. The Bible talks more about his second coming than his first coming. And he said, there will be conditions in the world which precede my coming. Some of those conditions, lawlessness, war, rumor of war pestilences and plagues, sexual perversion. Those are some of the things, conditions in the world that are going to be here before the second coming of the Lord. So he's returning. But the next time he comes, he's not coming as the lamb. He's coming as the lion. And it really makes sense to me because after all, He is the Lion King. Amen? I want to thank you for your rapt attention tonight. I am through. I hope you've learned something maybe that you've never learned or knew before. I'll be here to answer questions. I have DVDs and CDs back there and some items for sale. And I welcome you. There's free literature back there. Please uh, go back and take whatever you'd like of the free literature. And, <laughs> and uh, I'll be here to answer any questions. God bless you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to say a few words. I met David for the first time about four months ago. And Talk five minutes into meeting with him and talking to him at his very same altar, I knew this presentation was going to be something special, but is it exceeded all my expectations. This past Thursday after school, I met with him and helped him bring in some of the artifacts that he has downstairs in the St. Augustine room. Uh, he brought in a spear, which I looked at, the flagrums, the nails, the helmet of thorns, mm -hmm. and I was really moved by them. I walked out to check on my kids in aftercare. I came back, and he had set up the canvas that is in the back of the church, yeah. the huge canvas with the face of Jesus. And looking at that, I just broke down, and I just cried. It was well, well my if, friend, let me say that in studying this, I've wept many times. How can you and know? it was such a moving experience. It was like I was looking at the face of God looking at Jesus and like David said what stood out more than anything to me was realizing what he had endured on that two mile journey that led him to Golgotha flogged, beaten, punished all along the way his face was so peaceful and it was so tranquil it was just the most beautiful image that I had ever seen. And David, I just want to say thank you for bringing this to us, this gift. 
uh, I can't tell you how much it's meant to me. And like Father Heron said, I will never look at the crucifix in the same way, nor will any of my students who had the pleasure of coming down yeah. and listening to your presentation. They came back and they were so excited. They were quoting Bible passages. They were talking about what you said. Uh, they were talking about carbon dating. They said, Mr. Garski, we just learned about carbon dating in your science class, wow. where scientists, geologists use carbon dating to determine the age of rocks and the levels of the rocks in regards to a theory called superposition, where the oldest rocks are on the bottom and the newer tops are on the top. He said they used the same things Mr. Nasco was talking about in regards to the Shroud of Turin. So they were able to relate and tie it into their faith as well as science that they've learned. I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, brother, it was wonderful. God bless you and the work that you do. Let's just give another round of applause. Amen. Amen. Okay, it's been, it's been a long evening. I'll let you dismiss. If you have any questions, by all means, I'm ready to answer. Make sure you get some items back there, some free items to take home. And we God have bless one all other thing. We have some pizza and ho, we have ho, some ho, pop ho. behind the screen. So please, come on back. Give me a minute or two. I got the pop in my truck. I got to bring it out. I want to make sure it was cold. So give me a minute or two. I'll bring that out. But there's pizza in the back. Please come and enjoy Thank you so much.